even for people who are in good shape, even people who are outdoorsy, people who think that they understand heat, don't understand how dangerous it is and how quickly you can get in trouble. Hello, and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Juliet Eilprin, the Deputy Climate and Environment Editor at the Washington Post. Today, we're joined by longtime climate journalist, Jeff Goodell. He is the Hi, author- Juliet. Hey, he is the author of the new book called The Heat Will Kill You First, Life and Death on a Scorched Planet. Welcome, Jeff, to Washington Post Live. Thanks for Let's having get, me. Great. Let's get started. So I want to start with the brutal heat waves that across North America, Asia, and Europe, where hundreds of millions of people have been enduring blistering conditions for weeks. Can you put into context for us how alarming are these temperatures that we're seeing across the Northern Hemisphere right now? Well, they're of course very alarming because they these temperatures are so extreme and they are, um, you know, pushing the limits of of what humans and other all living things can can handle in these kinds of conditions. But, you know, it's really important to say that this is not really a surprise. I mean, you know, scientists have been warning us about um, uh, increasing temperatures as we continue burning fossil fuels and loading the atmosphere with CO2. And these extreme events, while extreme and while at the outer boundaries of what a lot of these models have shown, they're not um, beyond what what scientists have been warning warning us about for a very long time. So so it's a it's an odd moment because at once it's 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 kind of scary and it, it feels like things are you know spinning out of control heat wise but on the other hand um this is what scientists have been talking about for a very long time so that's where we are got it and in death cali uh, death valley california the heat capital of the country we had nighttime low temperatures exceeding 100 degrees obviously um uh, Phoenix has been hitting rec uh, record heat wave and averaging, you know, at least 100 degrees. Um, when you have particularly these evening temperatures being so high, what are the implications of that and what does it mean for human health? Well, you know, our, our bodies are like these exquisitely tuned heat machines. We're very good at keeping our body temperatures sort of stable around 98.6 degrees and when temperatures get higher our bodies have to work harder to cool off we have one cooling mechanism which is sweat and you know when it gets hot outside to maintain a cool interior body temperature our heart starts pounding and it starts pushing blood out towards our skin so that it can be cooled off as the sweat evaporates and that is um, difficult uh, for our bodies and it takes a lot of work and it puts strain on our hearts and on our circulatory system and on other uh, internal organs and our bodies need a break. And so um, when you have high temperatures during the day, especially for outside workers, their bodies have been working really hard. And if you have cool nights, then at least at night, the body gets to relax, the heart rate goes back down. There's a kind of recovery period. When you have these extreme night temperatures, there's no break. And so it really adds to the strain of our hearts and internal organs and makes these temperatures all the more difficult to withstand. Now, there are some people who obviously say, it's summer, it's hot, go into air conditioning if you need to. What would be your message to them and how would you explain some of the complexities that arise when we are all using our air conditioning, uh, you know, whether it's here or overseas at an extended period? Yeah, well, you know, in America, we love techno fixes and we love the idea that, you know, what's the big deal? We can just air condition our way out of this and we just need to get more air conditioning for more people and we'll all be fine. Um, there's a number of problems with that. One is that, um, there are billions of people on this planet who live in hot areas who do not have air conditioning and who are in, by all reason of all reasonable time scenarios not going to have access to air conditioning. So yes, it's important to democratize access to air conditioning to uh, energy programs that make it cheaper to run them. I've spent a lot of time with uh, in neighborhoods uh, with people who 
have air conditioners but can't afford to run them uh, because the electric electric bills are so high. So yes, improving access to air conditioning is important, but let's not pretend that we're going to get air conditioning to everyone on the planet at any time uh, ever. And also, let's not forget that we're not going to air condition the wheat fields where we grow our food and the corn fields. Those are not going to be air conditioned. We're not going to air condition, you know, the the oceans. We're not, we're not going to, you know, the, the consequences of a warming ocean for marine life and for our weather patterns are enormous. Uh, we're not going to air condition the sort of wildlife, all the other living things on the planet that are suffering from these extreme from this extreme heat. And then just finally, the the final thing is by being dependent upon air conditioning, we're also dependent upon this umbilical cord of electric power. And I am talking to you right now from Austin, Texas, where a couple of years ago we had a five day outage of uh, uh, our grid went down for five days in the middle of winter. And, um, you know, it was it was awful and people didn't have access to, in that case to heating. But if you had the same kind of thing happen when the grid is strained during some of these extreme heat waves, if we have a power outage in Phoenix you know, this week, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people will die because our houses are not built to function without air conditioning. Windows are sealed, all that kind of thing. They become convection ovens as soon as that air conditioning fails. Right. And that's obviously one of the things you cover in your book. Should, should for example, you have a blackout, some sort of massive outage in a place like Phoenix at this point, and obviously there have been studies about just the huge human toll that would that would take. Um, so we have a question from our audience, and it's Johanna Barsati from Illinois asks, I'm thinking about older adults and how they're moving to warmer areas, but sometimes they don't realize the intense heat there. How can organizations help raise awareness and support these vulnerable communities? For example, I've read about changes in our diet, like food that's harder to digest raises our body temperature. And we'd be really interested in your thoughts on this. And we, you know, we did an analysis just the other day for one of our stories, which found that for people ages 65 and older, their top destination was in fact Maricopa County. So clearly this is where a number of people are going, whether it's Florida, you know, in Texas or, you know, in the Sun Belt. Yeah, I mean, and you know, I, I, I'm a great example of that. I, I moved to Austin, Texas from upstate New York. Um, I moved here for love. I fell in love with a woman who lived here and had a job here. And I decided that I wanted to be in this place, even though I knew it was hotter and riskier. So people move to different places you know, uh, for all kinds of reasons. But it's also generally true that people like warmer climates than colder climates. It's also generally true that these uh, areas in the Southwest and Southeast are, are, are cheaper than uh, real estate and things like that. Texas doesn't have state um, income tax. Um, so there are lots of financial reasons why people are moving to these places. But I think also one of the big things is that, you know, and this is something I really try to communicate in my book, is that people just don't understand the risks of extreme heat. They don't get that how dangerous it really is and how quickly it can become really dangerous. And, you know, especially with these extreme temperatures, you know, it's one thing to go outside when it's 105 degrees. It's an entirely different thing to go outside when it's 120 degrees or even 118 degrees. These sm relatively small differences in temperature have enormous implications for the, the risks, uh, are, you know, mortality risks for people, especially older people who have any kind of um, heart conditions of circulatory issues, pregnant women, you know, uh, young children, people who are on various medications, you know, like diuretics or beta blockers, things like that. Is there any place that you found that actually has done an incredibly good job at educating people about the risks where, where it's made a difference? I mean, obviously, again, you cover in your book this idea of naming heat waves. Um, as one way to raise awareness. But I'm wondering if even even on a small level where that's you've seen that done in a way that's really made an impact. You know, a lot of places are experimenting with things. Um, you know, a lot of cities are naming these, you know, chief heat officers, um, which has been, I, I think, a very effective way of uh, heightening awareness throughout public health and government agencies and things about how we talk about heat. But I don't think I've found anywhere that is it is really um, uh, kind of escalating the awareness campaigns and and the other kinds of work that can be done uh, at the same speed as the risk is is accelerating. You know, you see cities doing lots of interesting things, trying to plant more trees, which is a good thing uh, for shade. Um, 
access to cooling centers, which is a good thing for people who don't have um, air conditioning. You have cities like Athens who are trying to rebuild, a, you know, an ancient Roman aqueduct to bring water into the center of the city in order to give people relief and to allow more green spaces. Paris doing things to uh, green the inner city and ban vehicles from from uh, the central part of the city. But but it's all, you know, just beginning and it's and, you know, it's just it, it hasn't at all. Um, accelerated at the rate that, you know, unfortunately, these temperatures are accelerating. And in, in terms of this understanding, the real toll that heat is taking, um, you know, we can actually say in part because of, of course, the action that has been taken in Phoenix, how many people die of heat in Maricopa County. But we can't say how many people have e either died of, of heat, you know, in the United States every year or certainly on the entire continent of Africa. What does that tell us about our understanding of the toll that he takes and also the inequity that we obviously see with some of these climate impacts. Yeah, I mean, I, I would argue that we, we don't even know the toll in Maricopa County I and mean, we have a number, but you know, heat is not like a gun. It doesn't leave um, a wound. And um, so it's very difficult to diagnose um, as a cause of death. Um, you know, often it, it's a heart attack or something like that that is the proximate cause of death. And then you only understand that it's for heat related when you understand the context. And if you have an investigation that, that looks at those kinds of things, I think it's widely um, understood uh, in public health officials and others who care about these things that I talk to that the actual mortality of these extreme heat events is is, is really um, underestimated you know we just saw a, a study in nature that came out um a few weeks ago uh with the death toll of six i think sixty three thousand people in europe last summer uh which was radically revised upward from what we had before so i don't think we have any real idea about the the real toll uh, especially you mentioned africa i mean there's no there's no counting of mortality in africa that that's it, anything close to accurate that i've seen there and obviously he just uh, takes its toll there as it does everywhere else so i don't think we're even beginning to really grapple with the actual health and mortality risks that these heat events represent and you know as they get hotter and strike in more unusual places those numbers are just going to grow and in your book, you tell an incredibly powerful and moving story about a Guatemalan immigrant who died working at a nursery in Willamette Valley in Oregon. Um, and that there are obviously thousands of farm workers and construction workers, um, UPS drivers who are facing extreme heat and risk their lives every day, yet there's no national standard to protect them. And I'm wondering what you, advice you have for people who are facing these conditions and, and don't have, you know, kind of the uniform approach that would give them greater protections. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's just, you know, scandalous in the United States that we don't have, you know, heat uh, protection. Uh, OSHA doesn't have rules about this. You know, here in Texas, in the middle of the heat wave a couple of weeks ago, you know, Governor Abbott signed legislation prohibiting local, local cities and things from instituting shade and water breaks for uh, construction workers. I mean, it's just, you know, outrageous, frankly. And, you know, the people who work outside are the ones who are very, the most vulnerable to this in certain ways, because as in the case with Sebastian Perez, the Guatemalan immigrant that you, um, that you mentioned, who I wrote about, who died during the 2021 heat wave while he was working at a nursery in Oregon, you know, he, he was from Guatemala. He had talked to his family. He understood about heat. He understood heat. He, you know, he thought he understood heat. But he also had a job and, you know, he didn't have a, a, a there's no, there was no union. There was no worker protections of any sort. And so he had to make the choice. Do I keep working or do I stop and take a shade break or a water break and risk getting fired? And, you know, he was trying to save money for a house to start a family with his wife. And, you know, um, that was a difficult decision for him. And tragically, sadly, you know, he made the wrong decision and continued to work rather than risk losing his job. And he ended up dead in a, you know, in a field in in um, in Oregon. And these are the kinds of um, decisions that outdoor workers have to deal with. I mean, I see it here in Texas all the time. You know, I mean, 
people out working on the on the roofs of buildings, you know, in this 115 degree heat. It's just, you know, crazy. And people who live in hot cultures, you know, if they, they um, learn how to deal with it, right? I mean, in the sense that everyone knows that the thing to do is to take a break, get have plenty of water and all that. But when you have a governor like we do here who doesn't allow that and who you know, puts these workers in the position of losing their job or risking their life, it's really um, barbaric. And one thing that, you know, we obviously face when you see these temperature records being shattered again and again, these, you know, intense wildfires that are starting earlier, lasting longer, um, these hurricanes is, to what extent do you think that people just get used to living on a hotter planet? And what implications does that have for cutting the greenhouse gas emissions that are helping drive some of these changes? Yeah, that is a really great question and one that I think about a lot. You know, there's there's a lot of, uh, we've talked a little bit about adaptation. There's a lot of talk about adaptation and things that we can do to adapt to higher temperatures. and. You know whether it's you know building cities in a, in a different way changing labor laws all of these ac improving access to air conditioning all these kinds of things but the kind of adaptation that i fear is going to take over is exactly what you're talking about which is that you know we're just going to accommodate ourselves to the fact that you know it's 125 degrees in the summertime in phoenix or 130 or whatever the number will get to be and People will die and that's just the way it is. And we will just accommodate ourselves to that and think that and forget that this is a climate that we created and that we can do something about and just kind of go along with it. You know, COVID was some kind of an example of that, right? The, the There was an accommodation of, of, you know, these death rates at a certain point and it was just like, okay, that's just how life is now. And I and I fear that very much with with how we're going to go forward with climate that is just going to be, you know, the background of our world now and uh, the losses that we will suffer from lives and, you know, all kinds of other things will just be seen as something that is happening and that, you know, we're not in control of and don't have any power to do anything about, which is exactly not true. And you write obviously a lot in the book about the impact of heat on humans, but also on ice, on corals, on crops. And what does the general public not understand when it, when we're talking about the dangers of rising temperatures, would you say? Well, you know, in the book, I tried to do two things. One is to, is to give a real personal um, description of what heat does to our bodies. I wanted to take the, you know, a lot of climate books are very general. They're about you know, rising temperatures of two degrees centigrade and things like that. And they're, they're sort of this sort of macro catalog of, of these impacts that climate change are going to have. And I wanted the, you know, the, the title of the book is kind of controversial, you know, the heat will kill you first, but I wanted it to be personal. I wanted it to, to communicate immediately that this is about our lives and how we live now. But the second part of the book, you know, that is interwoven through all this is the larger planetary implications of rising heat, right? So heat is the engine behind all of the other climate impacts. It is why wildfires are burning bigger and hotter. It is why, you know, the ice sheets are melting faster. It is the primary driver of all these other things. And I, the best example of this that I uh, can share and that I write about in the book is going to Antarctica. I went on a seven week scientific cruise to the West Antarctica, where a change in the Southern Ocean of temperature of just one degree Fahrenheit, tiny change, right? Small change that you would think would not matter at all, is changing the dynamics on the ice sheets and allowing this slightly warmer water to get underneath these giant ice sheets and begin to break them up um, from below. And they are beginning to fracture and things because the bottom is basically melting out of them. And that is, has enormous implications for sea level rise for the future of coastal cities around the world. So I wanted to use that as an example of how even these sort of smallish changes that sound like nothing have enormous human implications. And research has consistently shown that the warming planet is you know, almost entirely driven by our use of fossil fuels, whether that's in transportation, heating, manufacturing. If the world were to drastically reduce its carbon output, 
you know, how long would it take to see a significant change in these extreme weather events and, you know, ultimately shift in this trajectory, would you say? Well, I think the science is pretty clear right now that, you know, temperature rise stops when we get to net zero emissions. So, you know, every molecule of CO2 that we put into the atmosphere between now and when we get to net zero emissions will increase the temperature of the earth. And when we get to zero, then the temperature increase will stop. But what's really important to grasp, and I think a lot of people don't grasp, is that when we get to net zero emissions, it doesn't mean we go back to the climate that we had before. It's not like air pollution in the 70s when you put catalytic converters on cars and we put scrubbers on industrial sources and they, we cleaned up the air and then everything went back to kind of a, a cleaner, more beautiful air, right? And now the CO2 is not like that. CO2 has a, stays in the atmosphere for thousands of years. So even when we get to zero emissions, we're still locked into whatever level of warming we're at then. And you know, zero emissions is still you know a long way away, decades. Uh, so we're going to be living on a hotter planet uh, for a very, very long time, and we're not going back to the um, the old climate that we all grew up in. And um, you've been critical of the Biden administration's efforts on climate change and specifically arguing that the federal government should halt the extraction of all fossil fuels, right, to, um, to get us closer to this net zero. And now, obviously, President Biden and his aides say that to some extent, including, you know, most notably in the case of the Willow Oil Project on Alaska's North Slope, that their hands are tied to some extent by the laws that we have, that, you know, even as there was a huge push to deny ConocoPhillips the uh, ability to drill in that in that area, that they made this decision that it was better to cut a deal with this company than face a legal challenge and ultimately be reversed. Um, I just love you for you to share your thinking of what, what do you what do you think of that argument and how in an ideal world would the president of the United States and um, top aides uh, address these issues? Yeah, well, you know, I mean. I give Biden, President Biden and the administration a lot of credit. The Inflation Reduction Act was really, you know, incredibly important piece of legislation. I understand how difficult the politics are right now, you know, um, and when you, especially when you compare what President Biden has been doing compared to, you know, his predecessor, who was, you know, thought thinks of global warming as a Chinese hoax or something that, you know, instigated by Bill Gates and George Soros or something. I don't even know. What, what do you think? But, but you know, the, 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 the simple fact is, you know, this sort of practical politics at a certain level is taking us down a road to a hotter and hotter planet. I mean, this is an emergency. This is not a, um, you know, a, a deal that we can just, you know, the, the, the fossil fuel industry's clear strategy is to drag this out, the reduction of fossil fuel, of burning oil and gas, as long as possible. And everything that we do, especially opening up new drilling and opening up new resources and allowing access to new resources, just prolongs that. And the longer this goes on, the hotter it gets, the bigger the losses are, the more consequential it is to everyone and everything alive, and the more people will die. And uh, as that, and to pivot off the incredibly dark comment you just made, how optimistic are you that a drastic uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions is possible? Would you say? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that one. How how yeah. optimistic are you that that we could achieve a drastic reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, whether it's but you know both in the United States and you know abroad? When you look at it, you know in terms of per capita emissions, you know, and here we, the United States has made a lot of. Uh, you know, strides. So has the UK. So have you know a number of other countries. How you know? How you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, the 15 years ago, all the arguments were about economics, right? It was all we can't shift away from fossil fuels because um, solar and wind and everything else is just too expensive. Um, and now the opposite is true. Now, you know, for a new build, you would the economics of building anything to do with fossil fuels make no sense whatsoever. So. You know we're, you know the 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 engine for for dramatic change is there. You know the problem is the politics, right? And the problem is that you know the, the climate change stuff and the energy stuff has fallen into this cultural war that we're in right now, and it's become part of you know this battle about woke culture and you know the 
uh, science-driven elites, and you know you see it emerging in the anti-vax stuff and everything, and 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 that makes all this transformation really difficult because it's no longer, you know, based in kind of economic or scientific reality. It's based in this sort of cultural belief system, which is very difficult to sway. But you know, I, be, lest I sound like the Grim Reaper or anything like that, I'm actually quite optimistic about. The potential for change and how we can use this moment to transform our thinking about a lot of things. And I, I really do feel like um, there's a tremendous opportunity right now. And, you know, having covered this for 20 years, I see a tremendous change in, in the number of people who are engaged in this, who are thinking about this. You know, even in the couple of weeks that my book has been out, just the, you know, the the level of attention it has gotten and the people who are engaged and saying, wait a minute, I got to figure out what's going on here. And, you know, I, I remain very optimistic that we can use these times to kind of build a better world. Actually, and following up on that, I mean, obviously, uh, as some in our audience will know, you've written many excellent books, including uh, The Water Will Come, uh, about which obviously addresses sea level rise. Can you talk a little about how did what was the reaction to that book and how it differs from from this one and what that says about where we are in kind of the public understanding and the visceral reaction that people have to climate change, would you say? Well, you know, this book has captured you know, I, I think the imagination of people much more than that book. I think that book was, um, you know, I, I think it was widely read and I'm very proud of it and it did very well, but, you know, it, it didn't have, um, you know, sea level rise is not a life or death situation for people, for most people. It's a, it's a huge planetary issue it has a huge investment and implications for where we live and how we live and, but you know, no one stands on Miami Beach, and you know that afternoon something happens in Antarctica, and, and they drown because of you know the rising waters. It's a it's a big meta kind of issue, and and um, like I said, it has a lot of financial implications, but it but it doesn't have that kind of intimate you know human implications that heat does. And I I think that you know this book has gotten. Um, a, a more visceral response, you know, um, it's gotten a more uh, people are alarmed. And I don't mean that in the kind of climate alarmist way, but I mean that in the sense of, wait a minute, it's hot out there. And this is, you know, I'm, I'm worried, you know, I go out to walk my dog and, you know, I can feel my heart beating faster. And, you know, what do I do? And how do I handle this? And how scared of this should I be? And so I, I think that's good in the sense that it's like, you know, taking this, you know, what we're doing to our climate, uh, which has always been such a far off and distant discussion, even in my, even in the water will come, even though there are many cities that are f suffering from, you know, sunny day flooding right now, it, it's taken it away from the distant future and into an urgent, personal, your life is at stake kind of a conversation, which I think is really great, because I think it's really you know, I think we need to get educated about this. We need to get smart about how to deal with this. You know, heat deaths can be avoided very easily, really, if we know what we're doing. I think that awareness of this can save a lot of lives. We're almost out of time, but if there's one piece of information that everyone should take from your book, is, is there just one thing that you would say that it's important to keep in mind? Um, wow, that's a good question. I mean, you know, I, I, think, that, I think it's about this question of, you know, we're living in a hotter world now and it's going to continue to get hotter. And you, you meaning readers of my book and myself included, we need to get smart about how to deal with that, whether it means, you know, how to change our energy sources, how to change um, where we live, how we live, where, when we walk our dogs, you know, what, how much water we carry. I mean, we just need to be climate educated and climate smart because our lives really do depend on it now. We'll have to leave it there. Jeff Goodell, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And thanks to all of you for watching. To check out what interviews we have coming up, please head to WashingtonPostLive.com to find more information and about all our upcoming programs. I'm Juliet Eilprin. Thanks again for joining us.